The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus Fenstaden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, at the end of the month, Brazil's new president, or new new president, I should say, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, will be going to Beijing for his first visit to China, again, as in his second term as president. And he's going to be meeting with President Xi Jinping. Now, the visit comes at a very critical time as China is deepening its engagement in the Americas. And we've talked about this on a number of previous shows where the trading relationship is now becoming absolutely essential. And this is a relationship now that crossed almost half a trillion dollars in bilateral trade last year between China and states in Central and South America, considerably more than what China is doing in many other parts of the world, including Africa. And what's interesting is that it's a much more balanced trade, too, that we're seeing because countries like Brazil are presenting China with huge consumer markets. And at the same time, China's purchase of Brazilian products and South American products in general is really stretching across the range from commodities to agriculture to now increasingly the strategic minerals, lithium in particular. Also, it's very, very important given the tensions that we're seeing between the United States and China, and increasingly between China and a number of Asian states as well. So the relationship that China has now with these global South regions like the Americas, specifically Brazil, is going to be even more important. So, Kobus, it's safe to say that there's a lot riding on Lula's upcoming trip at the end of the month, not only for the Brazilians, but also for the Chinese as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they both have such a kind of direct material interest. And it also has these massive implications for the rest of South America. You know, as as we discuss later, there's all of these free trade agreements, possibly, you know, kind of in the future, but a lot of kind of coordination between different South American countries are needed in order to move forward. So, so this is a really, a really key region, I think, for China, and one that, you know, also then reverberates through the BRICS block, where, of course, Brazil is also a key member, you know, so all of the ways that it kind of plays out, you know, kind of through all of these different groupings. The BRICS block is very important, and one of the topics of discussion that Lula is going to have with Xi is about the new development bank, and we're going to talk about that later in our discussion. Now, this is one of the most important regions, a key region, as you said, Kobus, and there's a new book that's out that really dissects the key trends across Central and South America. And again, this is a very, very complex region, a lot of diversity, a lot of variety of interest in it. So just as it's impossible to kind of flat out any of these massive regions. It's especially true in the Americas. This new book, China and Latin America, Development Agency and Geopolitics, it was written by two of our friends at the London School of Economics. Uh, Alvaro Mendez is a senior research fellow and director of LSE's Global South Unit, and Professor Chris Alden, who's an international relations professor at LSE and director of LSE Ideas. He's also a research associate with the South African Institute of International Affairs. We had a chance to speak with Alvaro and Chris last week, and here is our conversation with both. Alvaro Mendez, Chris Alden, welcome to the show. Congratulations to you both on the book. It's great to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Great to be here. In your introduction to the book, you raised a number of questions about the China-Latin America relationship. And you started with this one that I thought was most interesting. And Alvaro, I'd like to get your take on it first. What motivates Chinese interests in Latin America and how has this shaped their approach to the region? So let's start there just with some background and a little bit of the depth that you brought to the subject in the introduction to the book. Yes, of course. Thanks for having us, Eric. I think the relationship starts really when China is looking for friends the very beginning 1950s and uh, they start to approach the region. So the region is not interested in China that much at the very beginning, but that's what really started the support that 
China wanted from the Global South, and that's how they established uh, diplomatic ties with Cuba in 1960. Over time, that relationship has been growing and growing to the point that now we have 25 countries in the region having diplomatic ties with China out of 33. So this has been a story of diplomatic recognition, cultural exchanges, and of course, in the last 20 years, massively economic trade. Chris, in our writing together, we've partly focused on the issue of agency. And, you know, we, in, in, in kind of some, some of the shared work that we've done together, it, it was particularly kind of like unpacking local agency on the African side and making the point that agency needs to be looked at at multiple levels through society, from the elite to on the ground. So I was wondering, you know, kind of with that background, like how the agency, the issue of local agency played out in the case of Latin America's relationship with China. Agency is a very important feature of, of the book and the study w that we conducted. It resembles aspects of uh, the African research that, that, that we've done and that's, that's out there insofar as it's an asymmetric power relationship. And so it's about weaker powers which have states, sub-state actors, non-state actors trying to engage with a larger external power and uh, extract value from that as they would read it or in interpret it. I think that the particular, some elements feature that cut across, I think, Global South countries in general, which is to say that governing elites, which have the monopoly over licenses or access to, for instance, resources, use their position to ensure that they get a better deal from China in this particular case. That better deal can reflect it directly into uh, elite interests or it can be more read more widely or, or pursued more widely in terms of development gains for the society as a whole. So I think there's a country-by-country country variation in the Latin American case. The distinctive feature that certainly I saw in this was the fact that uh, the structure of civil society is very robust. It's very substantive involvement in questions with, for instance, indigenous communities, the environment, the labor union movement. As a result, what you have with China's engagement is often at the implementation stage where these communities discover that a road is being built near their village which displaces agriculture or environmental, pollutes a river or what have you. That this, this becomes the spark for civil society activism. So I think that these factors exist in the African context, but it's really amplified and reflects the particular distribution of power within domestic systems in Latin America. And there's a much stronger tradition of strong trade union, strong uh, environmental and indigenous community pushback. So Alvaro, kind of picking up on what Chris was talking about in terms of the relationship that China has and some of the flashpoints, environment and civil society being one of them, help us understand where Latin America and the Caribbean fit for China in its hierarchy of regional priorities around the world. Trade now is boomed from effectively zero 20, 30 years ago, very small, to now close to half a trillion dollars this year. We're looking at a very strong relationship in trade and geopolitics politics and ideology in many respects with Brazil. There's a lot of cohesion between China and a number of Latin American, South American countries. How would you place this region compared to other regions around the world for the Chinese in terms of overall importance? Yeah, I believe the region has been increasingly featured as a central for China. I don't think it was the case earlier. And I think this has to do with geopolitical reasons. Of course, the U.S., the triangular relationship with Washington, but also with the fact that Latin America has some of the really, really deep natural resources that other re regions of the world don't have. So I think that plays an important element. Just can you, to can you tell us a little bit about those resources? Sorry to interrupt you, but what are those resources? Obviously, lithium is the big one, but what else? Definitely copper in Chile, Peru, quite important ones. Soya beans in Argentina and, and in Brazil. And those are, you know, key for, for China. But I also think that Latin America is a very important, also very important for Latin America as a buyer of Chinese products as well for China to expand their markets. So I think in that sense, increasingly so, Latin America plays a central role for China, but also diplomatically. People sometimes, they, they don't realize that the region is also geopolitically important. As you may know, Taiwan only has 14 countries that are 
recognizing diplomatically, and eight out of those countries are in Latin America. So that's another feature of, of the of the bilateral relationship with some of the countries and, and China. Alvaro, just, just following up on that, that has always been something that puzzled me. Is like, why does Taiwan have such a kind of like critical mass of support in Latin America and not elsewhere, particularly as we've seen it, you know, kind of erode very quickly in Africa? So what is some of what are some of the factors involved in that in Latin America specifically having this connection with Taiwan? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think partly it has to do with the fact that these countries were very close to the U.S. And when the majority of countries switched from Taiwan or switched to have diplomatic ties with Beijing, a lot of these countries didn't go in that direction. They're small countries that perhaps were not um, as significant as they could be for China at the time. And little by little, they are becoming more and more important because obviously they feature in the geopolitical relationship. Having said that, Taiwan is also an important partner for these countries. It was the case of Panama until 2017. Taiwan was an important uh, trade partner of them. And it is still one of the most important trade partners in other countries, such as Paraguay and, and, and so on. So it is an interesting feature. We believe that a lot of these countries want to switch from uh, Taipei to Beijing, but we still have this relationship that they have with uh, Taiwan because they provide important aid and, of course, important diplomatic ties. One of the, the countries that I believe might switch, we don't know, it's difficult to guess, might be Paraguay because it is the only country in South America who has diplomatic ties with Taiwan. And as we start thinking about, you know, Mercosur getting closer to China, Paraguay is a member of, of Mercosur, so that might be an interesting bit to take into account. Paraguay also put a price on its relationship with Taiwan, and it basically said, if you don't pay up a billion dollars, our allegiance is for sale. And so this is going to be an interesting test for Taiwan if they're going to cough up a billion dollars to keep their ties with Paraguay. I think part of these countries know that they're important. As I said before, Taiwan only has 14 countries recognizing it diplomatically around the world, including the Vatican. So the significant amount of countries is actually from Latin America. So these countries know that they have more leverage with Taiwan. At the same time, they also have leverage with, 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 with Beijing uh, because obviously makes them very unique, very special. I deeply believe that the countries that are still have uh, ties with Taiwan will eventually go to, to China. So, Chris, it's interesting that you participated in this book, given your background in studying China-Africa relations. And I think it would be interesting for you to reflect a little bit on what are some of the differences and the similarities that you see in the China-Latin America-South America relationship and that of what you've been studying for many years in the China-Africa engagement. Just as a background to how I got involved, I've been uh, invited a number of times, so earliest I think was twenty. 10, 2009, to Colombia, to the university there to do comparison of uh, China, Latin America, China, Africa. And then on the basis of that, had done some other, some funded support and then some research trips around working with Alvarez. It was in that context that I was exposed to and develop uh, further this interest. Having said all of that, I think that the parallels in part are f first and foremost on the China side. China had a, almost a template as to how it would approach countries in the global south, certainly in Latin America and Africa. Uh, and Africa provided many of the features, the institutionalized features that you see in Africa come into play as China engages more deeply in, in Latin America. What do I mean by that? Uh, things like you see FOCAC, you then, uh, which starts in 2000, you have uh, China CELAC, right, which starts in 20, correct me, uh, Alvaro, is that 20, 2014, 2015? We have then a kind of resources for infrastructure deals uh, that uh, featured, of course, in the, in the African context. Same firms are involved, the large state-owned firms. But then it, as the relationship develops over time, some of the differences play out. It's a middle, Latin America, broadly speaking, is a middle income a set of economies, more industrialized largely with, with a few exceptions like South Africa. And that means that the kinds of engagement we see differs as the relationship develops over time. We even have the migration question, which has uh, predates this particular surge in the late 20th, early 21st century. 
but at the same time is one that has grown uh, across the, the continent at this stage. Um, Alvaro, what, one of the kind of themes of the book is geopolitics and kind of shifts, you know, kind of as tensions, international tensions increase, or, you know, kind of particularly between the United States and China. And in the book, you, you make the point that early on, U.S. focus, there, there wasn't a lot of U.S. focus on the expansion of Chinese influence in, in Latin America. And you, and you call their approach kind of being a, kind of a mix of ignorance and indifference. And then one sees a, a, a very kind of rapid increase in attention, you know, from roughly from, from the kind of Trump era onwards. So I was wondering, you know, if you could give us a, you know, a, 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 a brief rundown of, of how the U.S.'s kind of approaches to China and Latin America shifted and roughly where we are now? Yes, I think that's a very good question. I think in general, the U.S. doesn't care much about Latin America. I think they have taken Latin America for granted. I think they're reacting now because they're seeing more and more the presence of China and they're seeing how this affects trade with uh, the region and the U.S., they're seeing how China is taking away number one spot in terms of trade from them. So there, there is a reaction, but these reactions are very sporadic. As you mentioned, you were talking about Trump and some other presidents have done it in the past. The U.S. has always been looking at other parts of the world. So Latin America hasn't been the most important one. So geopolitically speaking, they have reacted to a few things. I believe the first strong reaction happened in 2017 when Panama switched diplomatic ties from Taiwan to China because they saw this as a geopolitical element through the Panama Canal. Of course, this was a very important element. Then a few other countries switched, and Salvador, the Dominican Republic, and then State uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo actually went to the region to tell these countries that they shouldn't be doing that. Of course, countries rejected that view because they pushed back and saying, you know, this is uh, up to us to do. So the geopolitical element has been there for a long time. I think it's becoming more and more evident, but it's also partly due to the fact that the U.S. is not reacting. Just to give you another example to what I was mentioning, the fact that Xi Jinping has been in more countries than Obama, Trump and Biden combined also tells you how the U.S. has neglected the region. Of course, Obama went to a couple of places, including Cuba and Argentina. Trump only went to one country, Argentina, for the 2018 G20. And Biden just went to Mexico. That's very much it. So the U.S. has not been paying attention to the Chinese. And in that sense, that's great for China. Why? Because China only have to be uh, marginally better than the U.S. to be seen as a great and ideal uh, partner. And on top of that, China doesn't have that much dirty laundry in the region like the U.S. has. So that's why in many cases there is a very benevolent view of China by uh, a lot of the different countries in the region, which is uh, not necessarily ideal when you're trying to form a foreign policy strategy to deal with such a large actor as, as China. That may be the case that China gets that benefit of the more benevolent uh, engagement, but at the same time, there's no way to compare the deep ties, people-to-people -people ties, cultural ties, linguistic ties, and the fact that in a number of countries, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, the United States still is the dominant player. In many, I mean, there's no way to to separate the United States from a Caribbean country. For example, we did a briefing for a Caribbean government a few weeks ago, and they said, "Listen, we'd like to engage with the Chinese, but at the end of the day, all of our trade, all of our people-to-people -people exchanges, everything relies on the United States. And if we started to engage the Chinese, the United States has enormous, you know, leverage over us to make our lives very difficult. And so it, they're not equals in that sense, you know, between the U.S. and China." I agree with you. I mean, Washington still is calling the shots in the region for sure. I'm not suggesting that this is not the case, but increasingly so. They are losing ground big time. And I understand that most countries still look up to Washington, but more and more countries realize that Washington is not paying attention. You see that with many cases. Bukele from El Salvador, he went to Washington to get Washington's attention. He didn't get it. Bolsonaro did the same. They ended up going to China. But just on the point that you mentioned, I think that's right. Countries like Bahamas... Countries like Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil, I mean, politically speaking, have not endorsed the Belt Road Initiative, for example. They're the four, only four countries in the region who have not done that. I believe in the case of the Bahamas and in the case of Mexico and Colombia, this is because of the U.S. So I shouldn't, I don't, I don't mean to diminish the role of the U.S., but I would say and highlight that they are losing ground as we speak. 
One of the interesting kind of outliers in, in all of this is, is Cuba. And I had actually not particularly kind of focused on Cuba-China relations before, but you point out in the book that, that Cuba, you know, is actually, actually isn't as close to China as, as one might have expected. So, uh, you know, uh, Chris or Avro, like uh, uh, whoever's, you know, kind of works, worked on that, on that section, um, like I wonder if, if you could kind of expand a little bit on, on the role of Cuba in relation to China. I think oh, well, we both worked on it, so I'll, I'll say a few things and then Alvaro jump in. The, I think that history casts a long shadow. The Cuban position towards China was uh, quite pro-Soviet, it, though there was a flirtation at, after the Cuban Missile Crisis and the um, tricontinental meeting in the peak of the Cold War, uh, Havana came out and really pushed hard. And given the sign of Soviet conflict across the continent, it, it uh, across um, the Western Hemisphere, you know, the Cuban position was an important voice for Soviet interests in that dispute. Uh, that comes, and I, I suppose the elite to this day retains some of that, if not hostility, but certainly ambivalence. China's practical, however, and they, the Chinese pragmatism is, is in fact non-ideological, so I think they can and will engage with uh, Cuba if Cuba is interested, but so far they've had, uh, it's been limited. But let me ask Alvaro to embellish further on this. Yeah, in the case of Cuba, we conducted uh, field work in, in Cuba. One of the great things about the book, and I'll go back to the Cuba uh, question, is that we conducted field work in the region. We're not just simply writing out of uh, books or, or, or theoretical or, or secondary sources. We actually conducted field work in the region. So that gives us a very unique perspective because we spoke with people, policy makers from the region and so on. And that's an important. This includes Cuba. Cuba has been symbolically important to China. Also for the U.S., it's interesting. The case of Cuba is, is sort of very, very attractive to both the U.S. And, and, and China. Why this has been the case? First of all, Cuba was the first country in the entire region that established diplomatic ties with China, September 1960. And Che Guevara went to China in October 1960. This is an important historical part. Of course, Cuba ended up um, having stronger ties with the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. And that's, in many ways, one of the reasons why Cuba perhaps didn't develop a deeper relationship. But Cuba was there. They voted in favor of seating the, the, the Chinese at the UN in 1971. And it's still a, a contributing sort of image-wise uh, factor for the Chinese to keep saying that they, they, they are very close to Latin America. Fidel Castro went to China. And one of the visits that uh, Xi Jinping um, made to the region, paid to the region, back in 2014, that was his second visit, he actually went to Cuba. I believe that was an important element. Trade-wise, that not that important, partly because the Cuban economy is not, you know, very large. Uh, they cooperate and so on. But China has been, as Chris mentions, uh, more ideologically disconnected, meaning they've been wanting to focus with countries that, not necessarily on the left or right, with countries that can help and further their national interests and perhaps their needs, their economic needs. Yeah, Cuba lacks two important things that the Chinese seem to like in the Americas, cash and resources. So without cash and resources, there's not much interest there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think symbolic, but symbolically, it's an important country. And you see plenty of pictures of Cuba, Fidel Castro at the Chinese Wall, uh, the Great Wall, and plenty of pictures of Che Guevara with Mao, and also the picture, iconic picture of Xi Jinping with Fidel Castro when he came to see him in 2014. So it still plays an important role. And of course, they are sort of in between because the U.S. has a very ambivalent relationship with them. And the Chinese also have other priorities in the region. Well, Chris, I'd like to pick up on this kind of socialist communist ideology aspect of it, because when we look at Africa and the early engagement of the Chinese in the 1950s, Mao was very much supportive of the anti-colonial struggles. And that still has a legacy today, because many of the aging leaders in Africa who are connected to that have very deep ties with China. At the same time, the anti-colonial struggles in Central and in Latin America were also very important. And now that many of the largest governments in the Americas have shifted to the left, there is some ideological alignment. Can you talk to us a little bit about the socialist communist ideology and how it plays out in both the Americas and Africa in terms of how China sees these regions? 
Sure. It's it's a very interesting sort of dynamic that plays out in the, the Latin American one as compared to the, the African one, partly because decolonization largely happens in 19th century Latin America. Not not completely the case, but in uh, but for the larger countries in the S- South America in particular. So the generational experiential sense of of uh, this is is um, missing, where it is very evident in uh, the first generation of independent leaders and and uh, the younger ones with, that, that that came with independence um, in Africa. The other thing that's interesting is China comes in with a sim to Latin America as it does in Africa with this similar notion of no, you know, ideology is not. We're post Mao, though with Xi Jinping, it's a kind of reburnishing uh, Mao, and he's back in fashion. But in any case, in that first engagement from the late '90s into the 2000s, we have a sort of post Mao, a non-ideological pragmatism driving China's engagement, economic resources, markets, et cetera, et cetera, being the key variables and drivers. The Latin American case, what I think astonished them was the degree to which the the rising pink tide, the sort of Che Guevara and, sorry, Chavez and others, uh, Lula, were responding to and saw an ideolo- saw China through a, an ideological lens. And so the Chinese found themselves sort of uh, engaging with regimes that that would start with a celebration of the Maoist ideology as it influenced their thinking and the like. And the Chinese, you know, were quite, <laughs> take as I said, taken aback by that, but soon figured out that this was a, a an entry point. All of these things are entry points, right, into elites and uh, who, who uh, hold the keys to the resources, diplomatic relations, or any of the sort of uh, needs that uh, the Chinese uh, state and party would um, want to have. So I think that element was an unexpected one from the perspective of a China. Alvaro, one of the one of the aspects of of this engagement, and particularly as you know, kind of following up on on what Chris mentioned, is the issue of development. And and you you write in the book that that China became an alt, um, alternative source of ideas, financial resources, and practices of development that then became quite influential in in Latin America. So I wonder if you could expand on that, like what kind of ideas about development and what kind of practices of development ended up being influential there. Thank you. Just to follow on what Chris was saying about ideological issues, I do agree with what Chris is saying, and the Chinese have been very pragmatic. On the other hand, some countries think that because they are on the left, they might get a a better deal with China. But This is not necessarily the case. I think the Chinese are very pragmatic, and as exemplified with uh, uh, Chile. Chile established diplomatic ties with China in 1970 with Salvador Allende, and then there was a switch, of course, a brutal one in Chile with Pinochet arriving. They continued the relationship with Chile, despite the fact that there was massive ideological change in terms of Chile. Now, going back to the question on development, China becomes a very attractive to Latin America because they know we need the development that we have not been able to achieve for many years. One of the most precarious issues of development is infrastructure. Therefore, China knows that. In the same way, they know that in Africa that we need connectivity and so on. So there is an appetite. At the same time, Latin American countries are having a hard time getting that funding from countries in the global north, from traditional lenders. Therefore, the idea of offering development aid without conditions becomes very, very attractive. Therefore, policy banks know that they start lending to the region in many instances without the proper feasibility studies uh, to start with. And then, of course, you end up with massive projects that are not properly constructed and built. You end up with massive debts uh, around the country. One example, of course, is the case of Ecuador, which has been affected by this. But the idea of development still there is more refined these days. The idea has been now put forward through these multilateral development banks in, in China, which are important in the region. For example, the AAB is an important actor that offers uh, possibilities for funding for development, especially infrastructure. As you know, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has that mandate. And you have six countries from the region who are members. The AAB already has two projects, one in Ecuador and one in Brazil, and that has become an important issue for Latin Americans because, again, we don't have that much connectivity between countries. And the second element that we have seen developing in terms of that is uh, the new development bank, uh, which, as you know, is made out of the BRICS. 
but it has been expanding. So now the Uruguayans have been invited to join the bank. In fact, they, they have been accepted as a prospective member and right now are in the process of completing the domestic procedures to be able to join the bank, for sure. The attractive point there is development, financing development. Argentina is looking forward to join the new development bank because they have a hard time getting funding from the global north. And it's just interesting to note that in his upcoming trip to China, Brazilian President Lula is expected to address the issue of the new development bank with President Xi about naming former Brazilian President uh, Dilma Rousseff to head the bank. And so that would be a very interesting dynamic. I'd like to close our discussion with some reflections that you make in the book on the new geopolitics of Latin America. And let me just put a few things on the table for us to discuss as well. So we've talked about the upcoming visit from Brazilian President Lula to Beijing, which will happen on March 28th. Also, Argentina is getting ready to join the BRICS. There is a surge of Chinese investment now pouring into Latin America as part of the effort to circumvent some of the sanctions that are coming down on certain Chinese projects projects, and also to diversify supply chains. And so Mexico is a major beneficiary of that. We didn't talk about Huawei. Huawei is very, very present in, in the region. So, Chris, let's first get your take, and then, Alvaro, I'd like to hear from you. What should we know looking forward on this relationship and the new geopolitics of Latin America, kind of bringing some big thoughts to what you've written in the book and where we are today? I think the new geopolitics will remain in substantive terms driven by China and China's actions, and the United States seems to be reactive and reactive principally in a rhetorical way. It has, as yet, not really developed a response that can offer an alternative in development finance terms to the things that that Latin American governments want and need uh, and expect to see. So as long as the politics is written through, driven through the economic development lens first and foremost, that an inactive United States in that domain is, is going to continue. I wanted to add just one other thing to think about when it comes to the China development model. Like China and Latin America, they share one thing, which is the middle income trap is, is an area that they want and need to escape. They've achieved a certain level of development, but it's difficult to get to that next stage. China doesn't offer a model, a solution to that. The, in, indeed, what's happening is, re, is a, what they call reprimatization or deindustrialization of, of, the, of uh, the competitive Chinese goods and uh, practices there. So I think that that's a dilemma of a developing country to a developing country, emerging economies. But that one is some place where the higher tech approaches or different approaches from a United States or Japan. We didn't talk about Japan, but Japan and India also make a difference in this story. So I think that there are other models out there that are necessary for Latin American countries to make that leap out of the middle income status and up to a, a, where they want to be as an industrialized developed countries. And Alvaro, let's get your forecast for the new geopolitics of Latin America wrapping up the key themes in the book and what we've talked about today, what should we look for going forward? Yes, I think the view that I have, and the forecast that I have is that China will have more and more presence in the region and that the countries need to put up a good plan on a bilateral basis to be able to deal with China. We don't have group foreign policy here in the region. We have to have these countries forming a clear idea of what they want to do with China. I believe countries in the region have no idea what they want with China. I think China has a very clear idea what they want with each of these countries. You talk about Lula. There is a lot of hype with his arrival and, you know, his visit to China and the fact that he wants to place Dilma as the new president of the New Development Bank. I think this is a political uh, decision. I believe he's doing that to exile Dilma. And also a, a, a bad one for, for the bank. The Brazilian president that is at the bank is not bad. He hasn't finished his term. And so this will be only for a couple of years because in 2025, it is, we are supposed to have a new South African president arriving to the bank. That will be five years uh, presidency. So that's an issue that we need to take into account. Argentina joining BRICS, they, they have expressed that desire, they apply to it. I don't know how the new politics of the new development bank will play in, th in that sense. 
because of the arrival of Dilma. I suppose they will be very positive about it. They were positive so far. But Uruguay hasn't finished their membership completion, so I think that will have an impact on Argentina. Uruguay and Argentina are having some tensions. Uruguay wants to have an FTA with China, and Argentina has not been happy about that. Now Lula is talking about a possible FTA of China with Mercosur, which sounds great in principle, but difficult to achieve because then you have to get all these countries in agreement and then one of the countries doesn't have diplomatic ties with China. So I see a lot of hype. I believe the key element is for countries in the region to actually have a clear idea what they want, but they cannot do that if they don't think about China in the long term. I think politicians are thinking about this in terms of tomorrow and not in terms of the long term and how they can actually have a healthy relationship with China and other countries. When my concluding remarks will be Latin American countries have to realize that not all roads lead to Beijing, that they should be putting their eggs in different baskets, as you were mentioning, in Mexico. I think that's important. They have an overclosed relationship with the U.S. They have to open up to other possibilities as well. The book is China and Latin America, Development, Agency, and Geopolitics. And one of the funny things that we always like to track on this show is anytime we have scholars on talking about their books, we always like to go onto Amazon and to look at what the price is. And unfortunately, a lot of the books are at these absurd academic prices, well beyond the reach of most of us normal people. Get this, Cobus. 15 bucks, and you can buy this book on Amazon in a Kindle form and only $27 for a paperback. 27 bucks is still a decent amount of money, but for an academic book, it's amazing. Now, that being said, I'm actually phrasing this wrong. It's not really an academic book. The tone of the book is very accessible. It's not written in a very stiff way with, you know, 50 billion footnotes. It's really fun to read, and I can't recommend it enough. It's written by Alvaro Mendez and Chris Alden. Alvaro is a senior research fellow and director of the London School of Economics Global South Unit. He's also an adjunct professor and a foreign expert at the Institute for Global Public Policy at Fudan University in Shanghai. And Chris Alden is an international relations professor also at LSE and director of LSE Ideas. By the way, we're partners with LSE Ideas. And if you'd like to see all the great work coming out of LSE Ideas in our newsletter every Friday and also on our website every weekend is their great column. And it's open to everybody. It's not behind the paywall, so I highly recommend that. And also, Chris is a research associate at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Chris, Alvaro, thank you so much. Very quickly, Alvaro, you are on Twitter, and you're quite active from time to time. If people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yes, definitely. Twitter is one of the ways of doing so. Not only my personal account, but also the Global South account, the LSE Global South. But also for Chris, LSE Ideas has a Twitter account, and that's a good way of doing it. We have a number of webinars. We interact a lot with the with civil society. We have a working paper series. And of course, we write for your column as well from time to time. So that's a great way of doing it. And I hope people really enjoy the book. It is, as you've mentioned, accessible to both people that are not experts on China, but also to uh, academics. And I think that the language is, is very accessible. And most importantly, and I think this is very important to mention here, the book is not ideologically biased. It provides an account of the different actors. And I think that's an important element that people need to take into account when they're thinking about buying the book. And we'll put a link to the book and also to the various Twitter accounts that Alvaro mentioned. And I just want to thank you both again, Alvaro Mendez and Chris Alden. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to speak on this topic. Hobus, so often when we talk to particularly scholarly authors of these kinds of books of China and the Global South, they're oftentimes, in my view, and again, I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar in this, in any of this way, so I'm unaccustomed to this sometimes overly intellectual, very theoretical type of writing. This book is not it. This book is very practical. I would actually even recommend it for people who are not even specialists in the Americas because so many of the themes that Chris and Alvaro pick up, and you heard this in the discussion, are applicable to what the Chinese are doing in various parts of the global south. And conversely, 
how Central and South American governments are responding to the Chinese. And that too, there are parallels elsewhere. So even if you're not an America's expert or interested in the Americas per se, there's a lot of value in picking up this book and looking at it. And I keep mentioning to people, and this is my kind of personal view on this, that the Americas are only growing in importance to the Chinese. We've done three shows on it this year. I mean, the year is still young. And I think that speaks to the growing interest in Washington, in the Americas, and now among scholars about what the Chinese are doing in this part of the world. And I always have to remind my friends in Africa, when we talk about the importance of Africa to the Chinese, that in Central and South America, they do two and a half times the amount of trade. So economically speaking, this region is one can make a very compelling argument, far more important than many other places in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also really important in terms of the complexity of local actors. You know, as, as Chris and Alvaro have, have laid out, you know, South and Latin American societies have, have very powerful labor lobbies, for example, very powerful environmental lobbies, and, and so on. And in that sense, it also then echoes and amplifies, I think, some of some of the local complexity that, that frequently gets you know, could have covered over really only when one is only interested in a kind of geopolitical frame, you know, because frequently geopolitics tends to flatten the global south and to kind of uh, de-emphasize the complexity of the global south. And, and and I think they did a fantastic job in in heightening and making making it clear, you know, kind of how complicated like Latin America is, you know, as a as a set of kind of local actors, and particularly also the complexities of Latin American politics, and and how frequently China is not prepared for for the kind of level of complexity they have to deal with there. Interesting that both Alvaro and Chris mentioned the fact that there's been a dramatic increase in rhetoric coming from the United States. Uh, about the Chinese in this part of the world, but at the same time, substantively, there isn't much in the way of action. Of course, there was the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles last year that was an unmitigated diplomatic disaster when they played the whole kind of shenanigans of inviting some leaders and not inviting other leaders, and then some of the leaders who invited said they're not going to come. And so any effort that the United States had in mounting a unified coalition against the Chinese just completely collapsed. The danger here, though, is for a lot of observers who are new to this topic, we'll see people like General Laura Richardson, who is the head of Southcom, She is the top military commander for this theater, talking a lot now about Chinese influence in this part of the world. Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, where he's very big on this issue. So there's a lot more politicized rhetoric. And so, again, one may mistake this increase in rhetoric for an increase in substance. Now, in Africa, we have been seeing a big shift in strategy. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of have noted is the fact that they're trying to actually downplay the Chinese in Africa as a part of U.S. foreign policy. And it's interesting how in the Americas it's going in the opposite direction. So while the White House is trying to kind of say we're in Africa for Africans, that is the core message of the new U.S. foreign policy for Africa. But in the Americas, more and more, it's about henny penny, the sky is falling, the Chinese are taking over. So interesting to compare and contrast that even within the U.S. government, there's a schizophrenic approach in how they're dealing with China in these various regions. It might be also a reflection that Africa is just politically or like particularly economically not not as important to the US. You know, kind of it's it's no skin off their nose to be all Africa for Africans, you know, in, in, in dealing with in dealing with Africa because they because they, they know that that is you know, that that plays well in that kind of diplomatic space. Whereas in in Latin America there's this real money involved, you know, so so then it becomes a little bit more fraught. So one of the issues that I've been looking at most carefully is this question of the decoupling. And this is something that the Chinese really hate this idea. And again, they are as complicit in the decoupling as the Americans are. It's a complete BS line that you hear from the Chinese that say, well, the Americans want to break away from us. Garbage. Don't listen to that. Both sides have been pulling apart for so many years in so many ways, even though bilateral trade is at record levels On key areas of the economy, particularly in manufacturing, there is a determined drive on the part of Americans to end their dependency on China if they can. 
interesting workaround here, and this is going to be something that I recommend you follow. So while the Americans are starting to nearshore or friendshore, those are the two buzzwords of the day, the Chinese are taking a page out of that book, and they're saying, hmm, we can relocate to Mexico and then ship over the border duty-free. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Americans respond to that. (laughs) Okay, and so the decoupling thing may produce these very perverse outcomes for the Americans that it ends up driving a lot more Chinese manufacturing into the Americas that then takes advantage of the Mexican free trade agreement with the United States and Canada. So interesting things are going to be playing out in this. We're seeing already a lot of shift down here to Vietnam, but I think Mexico might be one of the big beneficiaries for that. Let's get some final thoughts from you on China, Latin America before we go. Yeah, that's a very interesting dynamic. And and it then sets up a possible fight between Latin American governments and Washington, you know, because of course, you know, for all of the global South, they are in in many cases, you know, desperate to, to attract more foreign direct investment and particularly more job creating foreign direct investment. So if there is a kind of a move from Chinese companies to to set up more manufacturing in, in Latin America, I can well imagine that that is something that that Latin American governments would want, you know, and, and that then kind of sets up a, 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 a very complicated kind of dynamic with Washington. So it's all really fascinating to see it play out. Yeah, well, just one little point on that, that in our newsletter earlier, a couple of weeks ago, we wrote about how Cherry, which is one of the Chinese auto majors, is setting up a new factory in Argentina. And they're specifically choosing Argentina because it's close to the lithium supplies for these EVs that they're going to be building there. So that is very interesting as well. So watch for more Huawei, more EVs, and more manufacturing to go to Mexico. Those are kind of some of the key trends, but uh, so interesting. Did you see a lot of parallels? I mean, you're an Africa scholar at your core. Do you see a lot of parallels in the China-Africa and China-America's relationship, as Chris was kind of talking about? Yeah, there's many parallels, um, including the key role of elites um, and the the kind of breakdown of trust between elites and and local populations and the way that that kind of impacts on Chinese projects frequently. And also the the this kind of like historical hangover, you know, that that, that Chris and Alvaro was 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 pointing to, to in relation to Cuba, for example. So, you know, even though the Cold War is so far away from our lived reality, some of these elites still have these very strong connections with that time. And you know, that is in part kind of driving you know, like non-China related issues like South Africa's weird flirtation with Russia, you know, at the moment. Um, so, you, you know, a, a lot of a lot of these these dynamics overlap. And it's, it's really it's really interesting to see them playing out. Once again, the LSE Ideas team that Chris runs and also the group that Alvaro uh, heads up as well contribute to our newsletter every Friday. And it is fantastic work that they are doing there. And so if you would like to get this kind of analysis that Chris and Alvaro are generating, and especially from their teams at these think tanks, uh, sign up for our newsletter, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We've got discounts for students and teachers, but this is where these discussions are happening about the Global South. Uh, Kobus, I was talking to an old colleague of mine at France 24 in Paris, and he's a subscriber to the newsletter. And I was saying, how come we can't get more of your colleagues and my former colleagues at France 24? And he said, listen, nobody here really cares about the Global South. They're focused so much on, you know, U.S. and Europe and the war in Ukraine and all this stuff. And that is just crazy because while everybody's focused on what's happening in the U.S.-China relationship, Taiwan-China, and these big issues like the Russia-Ukraine war, all of this other stuff is happening at the same time. And if you're not paying attention to it, you're missing it. It's that simple. And we go deep dive onto this every day. It's overwhelming. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot that we put out every day. It's heavy. But it's the only way to figure out what's going on with these daily digests. And I'm not even convinced that big intelligence agencies and, and big corporate research outfits have the capabilities that we have in terms of our team and the ability to synthesize as quickly as what we're doing. I'm, listen, I'm like a proud papa here. I'm super proud of everything that our group is doing. And I just want, I want to make sure everybody checks it out. And so if you'd like to see what 
our editors in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East are doing, and hopefully one day soon in the Americas. Uh, go again to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Also, if you speak French and Arabic, we've got dedicated services there as well. Those are all free of charge. So that'll do it for this edition of the China Global South podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week for another edition for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at chinaglobalsouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com.